In this video, we're going to talk about G proteins, hormone activity, and how calcium can act as a secondary messenger. So first thing is, let's go ahead and orient ourselves to the picture. Here we have our phospholipid bilayer. Now remember, this is a two-layered membrane. Now spanning this membrane of any typical cell within the human body, whenever we're looking at G protein receptors or G protein and hormone activity. It's a mem it's a uh, protein that spans the membrane. Now, because we're talking about calcium being the secondary messenger, we're going to go ahead and draw the calcium ion channel. Now, the hormone will fit into the G receptor, which is why it's drawn like so. Think of it as like the lock and key method of enzymatic activity. Now before the hormone binds, on the intracellular side of the cell there is an inactive G protein. Now it's important to know that it's inactive because the hormone has not bound to the G protein receptor. However, once the hormone binds to the G protein receptor, this will cause a conformational change and it will activate the inactive G protein. Now, once the G protein is activated, the G protein will cause the activation of PLC. PLC is phospholipase C. Now PLC is very important in this system because it activates DAG and IP3. Now it pulls those from the lipid membrane. DAG stands for diacylglycerol and IP3 stands for incital triphosphate or incital 145 triphosphate to be more specific. Now once this happens, IP3 will diffuse into the cytoplasm. Now, there are IP3 receptors on the smooth and rough endoplasmic reticulum. Now, when IP3 binds with the smooth and rough endoplasmic reticulum, it will cause the release of store calciums within the cytoplasm. This in turn will increase the intracellular levels of calcium within the cell. Now this is a very important step here because once the intracellular calcium levels are increased, DAG and calcium will bind. This in turn activates PKC. Now PKC is phosphokinase C, another enzyme. Now PKC is also very important because this is what phosphorylates the calcium ion channels. Now remember that phosphorylation is the process of transferring a phosphate group or a high energy molecule to something. Now once that occurs, it will also cause another conformational change on the calcium ion channels and it will cause it to open. This will cause the influx of cytosolic calcium into the cell. Once again, increasing the calcium levels within the cell. Now once this occurs, there will be an abundant amount of calcium within the cell and calmodulin will be able to bind to one of these calcium ions. Now once this occurs, calmodulin being bound to a calcium ion is what's actually going to activate other cytoplasmic enzymes that are able to trigger the effects within the cell. 
Now one thing I want to point out here is where your first, intermediate, and secondary messengers are. Your hormone that bound to the G protein receptor is your primary messenger. Your intermediate messenger is your G protein. Your secondary messenger in this case is calcium. Now, if you noticed, the system set up a positive feedback system, and I wanted to outline that because of where calmodulin is implicated to happen. The IP3, which led to the increase in calcium, which then led to the calcium binding to the DAG, which then activated PKC. Now remember, PKC, or phosphokinase C, was able to phosphorylate the calcium ion channels within the lipid membrane, which this caused the increase of intracellular calcium levels within the cell once again. Now remember, to create IP3, we needed calcium levels to begin with. Now, one example where this does happen, as I've stated multiple times already, is in smooth muscle contractions or labor contractions. Some other places where this is seen is with alpha-1 receptors and regulatory hypothalamus hormones.